Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Two short chapters, so we'll run through them rather quickly. But we're going to talk a little bit about um, the opportunities that youth have. The young men and and women that are here in this body in in Christianity uh, compared to those that are older, those that are broken, uh, those that can't do as much because of their age. You've probably heard it said that youth is wasted on the youth. And I remember hearing that as a youth and it didn't make any sense to me. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a youth. Why would you tell me I'm a waste? You know, but when you get this age and you start feeling the aches and the pains and you realize you can't do as much as you used to do. And yet you have all this in your mind, all this education, all this experience uh, you realize what is is important and what is not important. You l- learn to prioritize. Um, you wish you were young again so that you could do things a little differently. You know, I, I definitely would have done things a little differently if I could go back and uh, do things over again. And so Solomon touches on this uh, today in these two chapters about youth and how there's a certain amount of strength in them. Uh, they have the strength and the power and the ability. They have the ideas. They live in the culture. They're familiar with society and what's going on today, this day and age, and, and they can utilize that for the kingdom of God. And really that's the key is that they have to have a heart for God and His kingdom. I remember <clears throat> as a young parent in my 30s, 35 or so, 40 years old, somewhere around there, and my son going to Harvest and getting involved with the youth group there. And I remember the youth that would come to the house, and there would be 15, 20 of these young kids just just sitting there in the living room worshiping and, and opening up their Bibles and, and studying the Word of God. And that just blew me away back then. The Spirit was just moving in such a mightily way. You know, I, I haven't seen that since then. You know, but yet I've seen young men and young women in this body, you know, go to the various ministries, whether it's the women's or the men's and uh, whether they're events or conferences and so forth. And just as excited about the word of God, I'm amazed at some of the comments that I get um, from those that comment on Facebook, uh, on the devotions. And it's like, what an insight, you know, that they articulate themselves very well and the spirit is there and you, you sense it, you know. And so there's so much ability there. There's so much power there uh, and opportunities to really serve the Lord. And I want to encourage you, younger men and women, you know, <clears throat> I, I don't know where your focus is and I'm, I don't presume to and I'm not judging anybody. But when our focus is on God, it is amazing what you will experience from God. There's so much that God wants to pour into you. There's so much that God wants you to experience, the spiritual things. He wants to, you to experience miracles and signs and wonders. Not, not in a negative way or to be misused, but in a well-balanced way where you see the power of God working in your life and in the lives that you're touching because you're ministering. But you have to have a willingness. You have to have a desire and a hunger. We went to a youth conference um, Probably about four years ago, myself and Mario, I believe a couple other youth, young men. And um, they had youth serving the youth at the conference. We went to Marietta. And so you had these young men that were in high school or just out of high school. And, and I remember seeing these two guys that I believe they were related. They might have been brothers. And just two young men. And, and they were just busy always serving everyone. And they happened to be serving um, Mario, myself, and those that were with us. And we just kind of started a conversation with them, you know, how long they've been with Calvary Chapel. They go to Costa Mesa. They're involved in in reaching out, the youth and so forth, just young men. And they were graduated. They had graduated from high school and they went to the school of ministry and so forth. And so we were just kind of curious, well, when are you starting a church? You know, and, and it was just really refreshing to hear them say, we're too young. There's still more that we have to learn. 
You know, and it, it wasn't just like a gung ho. God's going to use me, and I'm ready to do it. It, it was a, it was a maturity, you know, in their answer, and, and that's why God's going to use them, and it is using them. They're learning to serve at this point, and they were serving their fellow youth. They were there at the conference. They were available to anybody. In fact, they made that really known to everyone. If you need something, just call me, and uh, you know, I'll make sure that you get it or that we can help in some way. You know, so they learned to serve. They learned to serve the Lord. They learned to serve one another. And that was just so refreshing to see in youth. Uh, when we have our couples dinner, it's refreshing to see the youth serving in the couples. We've had that several years now, and, and the youth get involved in it. They put on their little waiter outfits, you know, and they come out and they serve the plates and clean up and, and so forth. And that's the way it should be. They're learning to be servants because God has a greater work for them. God has always said that he gives you the little things. And when you're faithful with the little things, then he gives you bigger things to do. But we have to be faithful with the little things. And and that's one of the struggles with youth is, is faithfulness, sticking with it, you know, sticking with it. Uh, that's a parental thing where you have to teach your children to stick with things. Uh, you have to train them that way. If you always let them get away with uh, dropping the ball and so forth, then eventually... As they grow up, they'll always drop the ball. You have to teach them responsibility and so forth. Um, when that responsibility is there and as they mature in their age, it's amazing what God will do. Uh, you look at um, Randall, who's out at CC, um, not Oceanside. Um, uh, I missed it. It's out by the ocean. <clears throat> Just a young man, powerful teacher. And I remember when he was in high school at Costa Mesa. He went there all of his life, grew up there, you know, and now he's a pastor of uh, San Juan Capistrano, Calvary Chapel out there, and just a powerful youth, young guy, you know. And, and all of us here are capable of doing that. We really are. It's just the willingness to say, Lord, here I am like Isaiah, use me. Not in an arrogant way like, you know, I'm your answer, Lord, but, but in humility, Lord, I want to do something for you. And youth can do it a lot more vigorously than the older people can because they're young. They can last. They're strong. You know, they just have this, uh, this spirit of go get it and let's get it done. I can remember my younger years in serving the Lord and just being so busy serving the Lord. But I learned so much during those times. So I want to encourage you younger men and, and women, get involved. Get active. Start saying to the Lord, use me, Lord. Tell me what you want me to do. Direct me and guide me so that, so that I can be used by you in the kingdom of God. I mean, I'm broken now. I, I, can't, I can't go on mission trips. I, I'd love to go to Mexico, but I can't make the trip anymore. And so, because I'm so old, I'm falling apart, you know. Be careful, my arm might just fall off while I'm teaching. That's how I feel, or my leg, and I'm on one leg. You know, so there's limitations on me. And then some of the older guys here, too, they know what I'm talking about. You younger kids are going, yeah, right, you're only 50 years old. Actually, I'm going to be 52. So I'm not just 50. I'm over that hill. <laughs> and I'm headed downhill from that point on. And, and then my mom always says, oh, you're young. I remember when I was 50. Oh, no, Mom, you don't remember because I'm feeling it. <laughs> She's already 74, you know. But we're, we're limited because of our age and so forth, where the youth are not. So he talks a lot about that. So let's get into this. <coughs> As he, he puts value on benevolence and diligence. Benevolence and diligence. In other words, <coughs> expressing that love for others, taking care of others, that benevolence, watching out for one another, and then the diligence, the faithfulness of, of doing that. He says in verse 1 of chapter 11, Cast your bread upon the waters. For you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven, also eight. For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Now, again, he's using these, these type of parables or analogies to get a point across. You know, cast your bread on the water. Okay, well, what does bread look like? Well, it's on water. It's floating around, right? 
Uh, and eventually you'll find it in many days from now floating around. What is that talking about? Uh, serve seven people. Well, maybe serve eight people because you don't know when all of a sudden there's evil that comes upon you. And what he's saying is, is that be generous. <laughs> Cast that bread on many waters. Uh, throw it out there. Feed people. Uh, take care of others. Be benevolent because you don't know when an evil day may come and you might need some help. You know, if you take care of others, then others, uh, when you need it, will take care of you. If you're a type of person that, that's always watching out for others, then when you need a little watching out, they may come and help you out a little bit too. There's some wisdom there. And that's why it's important not to burn bridges, but to build bridges, you know, with one another. <laughs> Jesus used this same analogy as a parable in Luke 16 when he talked about an unjust steward. You remember how he went to a lot of his master's um, borrowers and he told them, look, you owe my master this much? I tell you what, pay only this much, but pay it off now. And so he was able to create these relationships with these men by getting them out of debt for less than what they owed, but his master got all their, his most of his money you know, and he could have had nothing, but he got most of his money. But because of that, when he was in trouble, he could go back to those that he forgave in their debt and they could help him. It's a good business tactic. I heard someone say that, that, that <clears throat> that's a good way to run your business. <clears throat> your small business or your big business, maybe you get too much business, then make contacts with other people that do the same type of business. When you have too much business, you can't take care of it, then give him some of that business. Well, man, you don't want to give your business away. Well, you can't do it anyway. So why not give it away to him, let him enjoy it, and then maybe when, when, when you're struggling in your business, he may give you some when he's prospering in his business. That's wise. That's taking care of yourself along with taking care of others too. But we get this, this idea that, no, we can't tell anybody how we do things. Because then they're going to find out and then they're going to take it away from us. You know, and then that goes my, my food and my security and so forth. You know, and so we're so worried so we never help anyone. Because it's just me, 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 me. And then when leanness comes, then we're like, now what do I do? Well, I sure wish uh, somebody could help me. You know, but yet that other person's going, no, no, I can't help you because I've got to keep it for myself. <laughs> you know, that type of attitude. But when you have benevolence for others, then others will have benevolence for you. Now, he builds upon that a little bit here in verse 3. If the clouds are full of rain, <clears throat> they empty themselves upon the earth. That makes sense. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. <clears throat> Things happen. You expect it to rain on your crops, but sometimes the clouds come and they're 50 feet over and it rains. You know, like, ah, oh, why couldn't they just be over here? You know, be a little smarter, build an aqueduct over there and hopefully bring it over here. You know, trees fall and it'd be nice if they fall closer to you so you can cut them up and use them as wood. But sometimes they fall way over there. Things happen in life that we're not in control of. <coughs> God is in control of them. And so when those things happen, it's good to have others to, around you that will help you out during the lean times. He who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. So there's some wisdom there. I mean, you obviously observe the wind and you know that it's blowing. Is that a good time to sow your seeds? No, not really. You throw your seeds down and they just blow off to another place. It's like, it's like Roundup, you know, when you put weed killer. You don't want to put weed killer on a windy day because you spray it and it just goes all over the place. You're not killing the weeds, you're killing your grass. So there's some wisdom there. You know, and I think we all understand that and know that. <clears throat> As you do, do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. <clears throat> God is always working. <clears throat> we don't know the wind. <clears throat> now, here we are, 21st century, we have all this technology and we just can't predict when the wind's coming. No one said anything on the Weather Channel that we were going to have a wind this week. Usually they have a little little explanation point with a red thing telling you wind's coming for this many days. In fact, the wind was supposed to stop at 6 o'clock and it hasn't stopped. We still don't know where the wind is coming and going. You know, we have no idea. Even birth itself, we can get an idea of how birth 
takes place and so forth. We've seen the videos on it, but we really don't know how it works. We really don't know. You know, the scientists today don't know. I'll tell you why they don't know, because they, they think that it's just some sort of organism and we can discard it. And they don't realize that it's life itself. And so they're confused over even what a fetus is, a child, a human being. <clears throat> but God is always working. He's always doing something. Even in your leanness and times of struggles and pains and sufferings, you know, God is working in your life. Why? Because he loves you. God loves you so much that he wants you to mature within his kingdom and his truth. He wants you to understand who he is and the power that he has for you, the blessings that he has for you. But if you push him away and you don't learn through those things, then you're still a square one. You know? And that's sad because you're like an adult with diapers and you haven't learned, <clears throat> you haven't matured. You haven't learned those fundamental things of forgiveness. You haven't learned to let go. You haven't learned to trust God. You haven't learned to depend on Him completely, 100%, and let everything else go. <clears throat> God's always working. He, was working. he works all things out for good, right? All things. <clears throat> so just as, the, just as the Spirit moves <clears throat> and the wind blows and how the bones are are put together, only God knows. And so He's the one that's working in our lives. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eye to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many, all that is coming is vanity. <clears throat> now he's talking about death there. Death is coming. Enjoy what you have because it's all vanity. Now there's some truth here. You know, there's some truth here. <clears throat> we don't know. We really don't know what tomorrow brings, do we? I mean, we don't know what will happen. You know, I was, we were putting all these chairs up, you know, and I was thinking today in my, in my head as I was going home and preparing the study and so forth. I'm just thinking, Lord, we got the chairs. Now bring the people. And, and, and then he just kind of whispered to me and, and says, so you think it's the chairs, huh? I'm like, no, I don't think it's the chairs. I don't think it's the chairs, Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> just bring the people. <laughs> you know, it's not the chairs, you know. I mean, because we're so excited about chairs. You know, we're excited about chairs. I'm excited about chairs. You know, we had all these guys here like little ants working away and putting them together and coming up with all these ideas. We had them sideways and figuring to move them this way and that way, measuring tapes. And I mean, we didn't bring out the lasers, but we almost did. <laughs> you know, we got excited about chairs. You know, the Lord remind me, get excited about souls. There are people out there that need need Jesus, you know. And we need to get them in here, not for the chairs, but for God. So they can have a personal relationship with God. They can experience God. That, that's my goal as a teacher, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, but also to unify us in our fellowship one with another, that we may experience, as Ephesians 6 tells us, that we may experience God, the fellowship of God Himself in our lives, in our hearts, moving. So that when you are praying... And when you're seeking God, you hear His voice. You hear His voice. Uh, being sensitive to the Spirit of God moving in your life. Those are important things. Those are very important things. <laughs> is your relationship with God. <coughs> I think that air is making me cough, Randy. Sorry. <clears throat> so it's all vanity. We're going to die. So what is important is we get the gospel out. Now here's some advice. And the rest of this chapter and the next is... Is advice to the young. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer <clears throat> you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. Now, that is not good judgment, first of all. Rejoice in your youth. It's good to rejoice in your youth. You should rejoice in your youth because you are young and you're going to get old one day. I know you don't understand that. You know, you're young and you think you're going to stay young for the rest of your life. You're going to stay young... <clears throat> well, you're in high school till you're about 44, 5. 
And then all of a sudden something happens. You go, wait a minute. I can't see anymore. You know, and it's like it just boom. What happened? And you go to the doctors. I can't see anymore. What is going on here? And you're concerned because you're like, I could see all my life. And now I just can't see what is going. And the doctor says, you're getting old. What do you mean? You're getting old. And usually around that age, you start losing your sight. You can't see as well. What? <laughs> Don't tell me that. You know? Uh, and then from that point on to 50, I know what it's like being injured. I know that, that you're still strong. I know that there's still so much to do. You know, so I can't tell you what that's like. And I can't tell you after 52 what that's like. You know, I know it's going to be different. Uh, from what I hear from others is that the older you get, the, the more you realize you can't do some of the things you used to do when you were younger. Like picking up things, you know, moving fast. Or, you know, it used to be that if you reached for a cup and you dropped it, you grabbed it real quick and then you just poured your milk. And now you're like this and the cup like fell down. Like, what happened? My reflexes are even going, you know. That even goes and so forth. So rejoice while you're young. But it's not going to last. But rejoice because God has you in a, in a great place and you should rejoice. But when he says here that you are to walk in the ways of your heart, be careful. Be careful there. And in the sight of your eyes. It, it's not good to walk according to your heart. Because the Bible says our hearts are what? D wicked. Deceitful and wicked. Who can even know them? You know, now, if you follow your heart and you're following the desires that God has given you in your heart and they're according to the scriptures, then yeah, go for it. Go for it. And I don't want to limit anybody from, from doing that. I think those of you that have been working with me very closely, uh, you guys all have great ideas. I say go for it. You know, Maybe it's just <clears throat> I'm older now and I want to see what the Lord does and I want to hinder him. So I'm like, go for it. Do it. Let's see what happens. I'm not going to say no. Now, if it's something that's not scriptural or biblical, then yeah, of course I'm going to say no. Let's not do that. We don't want to do that. But we can do this. You know, maybe go that route you know, and so forth. <clears throat> but to follow our heart, you know, um, be careful. We need to have that balance that, that, the, <clears throat> that it's not our hearts and emotions running us for the wrong reasons, but for the right reasons because our hearts are deceitful. Then he says, but no... That for all these, <clears throat> God will bring you into judgment. That is your heart. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. <clears throat> there is a, a certain amount of immaturity in youth. And I don't say that to offend you. I think that you have to realize that. You, you don't know it all. Just as I mentioned earlier, these two young men who realized we're not there yet. We're still at a place where we need to learn a lot more, you know, before we start a church or go out and venture in faith. And I think that's why there's that there's that little saying that we've all read, you know, at the age of, you know, toddler or so forth. Mom and dad know everything. And when you're a teenager, mom and dad don't know everything. And when you're a, <clears throat> a young adult, it's like, eh, I go to mom and dad once in a while, but I don't really, you know, trust in them too much, you know. And then when you get older, you say, no, nah, I really want to talk to mom and dad because they got some wisdom, you know. And you just learn that through life and through through time and, and so forth. And so he's saying here is that as a youth, you have to be careful you know, that your heart isn't wrong, that you're respecting you know, your elders, it's important. You respect the leadership. You understand that I am a youth and, and my thinking might not be as mature as someone who has experienced you know, life itself. And so I need to listen. Now, I understand that, that sometimes we, we hear them and we hear what they're saying. And then in our minds, we're thinking, because I've been there, we're thinking, yeah, but not me. <laughs> that won't happen to me. Be careful. Be careful. Because it may happen to you. Because you're saying it won't happen to you. Especially if it's something you shouldn't be doing. You know. Now if it's a step of faith in, in Christianity and the kingdom, then I say go for it even as a youth. I, I say, hey, hey, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to get involved in the high school Bible study. 
I'm going to see what's going on there. And if nothing's going on there, I'm going to make sure something starts happening there. Go for it. Or young adults or grabbing other young adults because it seems like young adults like to hang around young adults. You know, young kids like to hang around young kids. You know, grab them and be a leader. Be a leader. Don't be a follower. Be a leader. Lead them to the scriptures. Bring up the ideas of studying the Bible. Bring up the ideas of getting together and let's just worship the Lord and, and so forth. You know, be a leader. Don't be a follower. Take those steps of faith. Venture out because God will bless them. Yeah, it might not be perfect. It might not be perfect. And, and you don't want it perfect. You want it real. And, and you want it coming from your heart to serve the Lord. And then you just let God do that work. You're going to mess up, and that's part of life, and you learn from all those various things. I just heard a pastor on the radio sharing that he made a lot of mistakes. You know, he's learned all these years not to repeat those mistakes and so forth. It just takes time. That's why I think that we need to love one another in spite and just trust in God. Put our faith in him and not in one another. So he gives more advice to the young here in chapter 12. He says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. That is so important, kids, young young men and women. Remember your creator. He created you for a special reason, a special task with a purpose. You have to remember your creator. Who is your creator? He is your God. He is your king. He is your Lord. You are his child. He's yours. He's your God, just like he's my God. You have to remember who your creator is and put him really in the center of your life. And your life should revolve around him before the difficult days come. Now he's talking about age. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. So commit yourselves today. Commit yourselves while you're young. Commit yourselves because one day you won't have as much energy. You won't have good health and you won't have the strength to do some of the things that you could do because you're young. <coughs> That's what he's saying here. Well, the sun is well, the sun and the, and the light, uh, the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. Well, he's talking about the sight. Well, you still have sight because, you know, the sun and the light aren't as bright as they used to be because you're getting older and you're losing your sight in a sense. I hate that, that I lost my sight. And now I have to wear glasses all the time. And I don't really need glasses. I can see you all perfectly clear. But I cannot see the scriptures at all up here without these glasses. They're actually bifocals. So I've learned to just wear them all the time. You know, because then I can read <laughs> whatever's close to me. Otherwise, I'd have to be going like this all, you know, and then I have big old muscles because my arm's going up and down trying to get my glasses. <laughs> you lose your sight. You know, I don't know. It's just funny. I don't know if you experienced this, but I pull my keys out now and, you know, I go to put them in my thing. And I'm like, ah, oh, why can't I get the hole? How many experience that? Come on. It's not just me. See, and it's all the older people. It's all the older people, the younger ones are going, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about, you know. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to you. We, we lose our sight. Serve the Lord while you still can see. Because there will come a time where the age just will dim everything. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men bow, bow down. When the grinders cease because they are few. And the grinders is the teeth. And while, while you still have teeth and you can talk, you're not wearing dentures, you know, and you got to put them in the glass in the middle of the night type of thing here. Uh, though, and those who look through the window grow dim when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. I mean, you can't hear anymore. OK, there's another one. I mean, I could hear my wife clearly all the time and she could hear me clearly all the time. Now it's like, what'd you say? Forget it, because I just said it about ten times and you didn't hear me. And now it's like we're talking to each other loudly now. How many experienced that? You know, they see all the older people again. You can hear each other now, but there's going to come a time where all of a sudden you're going to go, "Huh? What'd you say? I said, uh, what? I didn't hear you." 
Oh, forget it. You never hear me. And then you're like accusing each other of not listening to each other. You know what? Your hear, hearing's going. It's just going. And you're, you're getting old. And so while you're young and you can hear people, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sounds uh, grinding is low, when uh, one rises up in the sound at the sound of the of a bird, now you can't even hear birds. <laughs> and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of heights and of tears in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshoppers is a burden, and the and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home, that is, he dies, and the mourners go. About the streets. <clears throat> I probably could have traveled more when we were younger. I can't travel now with Virginia as we're older because she will not get on a plane. So those opportunities are not there for us. So, so the fear of heights, as he's saying here, is, is, is one of her struggles. It's now one of my struggles, too. I mean, I remember going to Knott's Berry Farm and hitting the rides and just enjoying the rides. And then all of a sudden, around 40-something years old, I got on one of those rides. And I tell you, I was sick to my stomach the rest of the day. I was dizzy. I'm like, what is going on here? Why is my body reacting like this? Never happened before in my life. And now I'm way up there in the sky. I'm like, oh, man. And I'm dizzy and... You know, my equilibrium is off. I'm like, that is so weird. So from that point on, I've never been on those rides again because I do not like that feeling. We're getting old. McGee said that when he gets up in the morning and comes down the steps, he says, I groan because he's just so old and he's going down the steps like, oh, oh, oh. And he says that his wife would ask him, why are you groaning? And he would just tell her, it's scriptural. Paul said, make a groaning in 2 Corinthians 5, 4. So I groan all the way down the stairs. You know? <laughs> but he was a powerful preacher. Great man of God. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loose or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountains or the wheel broken at the well. When the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So again, before you die, before your soul goes back to heaven, you remember your creator. Don't be preoccupied with this world. Be occupied with the kingdom of God. You can do a lot in this world that will take up all your time. Oh, there's so much to do. And it's crazy how much there is to do. And, and you can do it and, and enjoy yourself and be preoccupied with it. And, and you can even you know, neglect or even not think of the kingdom of God. And, and you can be busy all day long. But is that the priority? Is, is that the right thing to do? <clears throat> I don't believe so. Especially in these last days. We need to stand up. We need to rise from the youth to the olders and do whatever we can to preach the gospel in 2014. I mean, I'd like to see these chairs filled up. I really would. With people that love Jesus and need to know Jesus. I would love to see your families. I'd love to see my brother here. You know, I'd love to see those that we love here in the kingdom. We can't stop praying. We can't stop asking God to do that. We need to keep doing that. Because eventually, as he said here, the silver cord is loose, the golden bowls. And some say that that's speaking about the body, the spinal cord, you know, the, the strength of, of your human being and so forth. It all will go away. Then he concludes in verse 18 through 14. He, he concludes the way he started, kind of vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Is that true? No. We've learned that, right? God has a purpose and a reason for everything. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he shall, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. Could be he's talking about the book of Proverbs. He continued to <clears throat> find and seek and study life and humanity and, and come up with some great wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And I think that if you <clears throat> look at life through the lens of the Scriptures and God, 
I think you can come up with great proverbs of what life is about. Even we can, because we have the Spirit of God in our life. The words of the wise, verse 11, are like goads. <clears throat> That's an interesting phrase right there. The words of the wise are like goads. What is a goad? A goad. Remember in the King James Version when Paul was going to Damascus and the Lord says, you're kicking against what? The goad. It's a stick that they would sharpen. And in order to get the cattle to move, they would poke it with the stick, the goad. And it, they would go, ah, and they'd start moving forward and you keep poking them. Today they use electrical shocks. they got these little laser guns and they just shock the guy in the back and he starts pushing the rest of the cows forward and so forth. And it's interesting, the words of the wise are, are like goads. They pierce, don't they? I don't mean them to pierce. Um, Virginia was <clears throat> sharing with me tonight that someone might have been offended on Sunday's message because I was talking a lot about Obama, political government, and things like that. The context was there for it all. And, and it, in a sense, you know, the words were like goads and they were poking at people, you know, and it does that. You know, I don't mean to offend you. I don't do it on purpose. You know, it comes up in the scriptures just like it did now. So, but if you get poked, it's because they're wise words and you have a choice to either heed them or neglect them, reject them. That's up to you and God. And you can do that. That's your relationship with the Lord. My job is to make sure you hear the message of what the word is saying. I'm an expositorial teacher. And that I just teach what the scriptures are saying. I don't add to it. I try not to. And I try to repeat what they're saying. Make it a little more simple, you know, so that we have an understanding of what the scriptures are saying, you know. And just keeping it that simple. Simply teaching the word simply. And the word will do that. It will be like a goat. And some of you will sit there and like, why did he say that? That wasn't right. That hurt. How does he know? That's the Spirit of God kicking at you and, and wanting to move you. Because that's what a goat does. It moves you to go get milk or to go get fed, you know, so that you can gain nourishment and continue to exist in life itself, you know. And so the Word does that. It does it to me all the time. You know, I'm convicted by the Word as I'm studying it and getting it ready for you. you know, and I don't always like what it has to say. But I always believe it and I always receive it. I may not always do it. You know, God help me that I need to be a doer of the word too. But the words of the wise are like golds and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. It's God's word, right? He's the shepherd. And it can be a nail and it may nail you right in the heart, right in your pocketbook even. But it's his word. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is weariness to the flesh. <clears throat> With, without works, your study is useless. You can study all day long. I know people like that. They just love studying. They love knowledge. They love books. And they'll read all day long. But they have no concept of applying it practically. In their life. And it's wearisome. If you have all the knowledge in the world and yet you can't read. Uh, I have a really close friend that's just amazingly intelligent, reads a lot, can quote all kinds of quotes, you know, that you just, you, you look at them and you go, man, I wish I could quote and remember stuff like they do. But they are so challenged in their maturity. It just, it's amazing. They're up at one point, and they're down at the next point. You know, and just like, boom, 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 and you don't know where they're, where they're coming from. You know, and they're challenged in that way. And sometimes that happens, right? They say that some people are very smart and intelligent, and yet in other areas they, they lack, if we can find that balance. But too much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. She so says, oh, I'm done. 
This is the whole conclusion. This is the, the result. This is what I've come up with. The Solomon king, the wisest man in the word, world, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. How simple is that? Right? Just reverence God. Love God. Keep his commandments. That's all you got to do. And Jesus said the same thing, right? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by this you fulfill the whole law. Pretty simple. Just love. Love God. Love your neighbor. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. We don't even know it. Paul said, I don't even judge myself. Because there are times I don't even know my own heart. So I'm going to let God judge me in the end. Because he knows my heart and the motives of, of the things that I do. And it says it right here. Solomon says, God will judge everything at the proper time. So I encourage you, young men and, and women, God has a plan for you. Start asking him, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? I'm here. Use me for your glory. And us older people, let, let's, let's help them. To do that. Let's help them to do that. And let's join them. Let's support them. And encourage them in those areas too at the same time. Because the possibilities. Right here in this room. The possibilities are endless right here. Only took 12 men with Jesus. We have more than 12 here. And we can reach this community. So I encourage you maybe young guys going out. And witnessing with, with them this coming Saturday. Just to see what it's like. This to get that experience and watch how God touches people's hearts. If you've never seen someone touched by the truth, it's a good experience. Let's pray.